Ooh, this beats too much. Hey, you guys, welcome to Data Dump by Noe. Yeah, that's our real name, but we got your attention, right? This podcast is focused on sharing meaningful and entertaining, read not boring information about data analytics, business intelligence, startup culture, machine learning, artificial intelligence, leadership, and more through interviews and storytelling. We may also digress on topics related to dogs, coffees, and tattoos, and we're glad you're here. So let's get going and dump some data. What's up, everybody? I'm Sarah. And I'm Sean. And welcome to Data Dump by Noe. We're on episode six. It's kind of hard to believe, Sean. I feel like, you know, well, part of it is like we haven't recorded an episode in what, a couple weeks? We haven't, yeah. But we are on episode six and we are slowly coming out of the pandemic. So there's there's reason for hope here. Oh my gosh, I know. Uh, Sean is vaccinated. I am vaccinated. Our guest today, Megan, are you vaccinated? I am vaccinated and ready to roll. Oh yeah, we are on that vaccination train. Oh my gosh, uh, sidebar, Megan, will you tell everybody where you're going next week really briefly? Yes, I'm going to Iceland because I really need to see that volcano. Iceland. So yeah, we're coming out of this pandemic. People are starting to travel. This is thrilling and exciting. But you know what else is thrilling and exciting, especially for Megan and myself, is the fact that April is Autism Awareness Month. And for those of you guys that don't know the backstory about me, not only do I love data analytics, I love people with autism, and I have spent the last 24 years of my career really focused on helping to support individuals with with autism to live their best, most fulfilling lives. So this is a a population that's very near and dear to my heart. And when Sean and I were talking about what we wanted to do for our sixth episode of Data Dump, it made so much sense to look at autism, especially as it relates to helping to address the shortage of talent in the tech industry because there is some pretty cool stuff going on and, you know, some really great stuff that's, I think, going to kind of take uh, autism employment and this relationship with tech into the future, which is why we have our girl Megan on the episode with us today. But I'd like to first kind of start by reading you guys uh, a quote from an article that was published in Forbes magazine or Forbes online on January 12th of this year. And we've linked this entire article in our show notes. So it's this autism employment initiatives with major employers continue to grow in number, but combined they impact a very small percentage of the autism adult population. So over the last five years, more and more autism employment initiatives have been launched by major employers and the most high profile autism employment initiative, which is called autism at work has grown to encompass 20 of the largest companies in the United States. So you have firms like SAP, Microsoft, VMware, Salesforce. Interestingly, though, the Autism at Work um, initiative hires total or hires fewer than 800 adults. They hired fewer than 800 adults by the end of 2020. And even they have another 80 or so major employers that have um, autism hiring initiatives outside of Autism at Work. But together, those employers only the aggregate is 1500 hires. So this is, to me, an incredible call to action of, wow, Uh, that's great for those, you know, 1500 people that have acquired uh, jobs within these, you know, incredible industries in the US, but that represents a a fractional percentage of the adults that have autism spectrum disorder within the United States right now. And of course, we know that people with autism can be great employees in all types of different industries. But since Noe is a, a tech company, we really wanted to focus this conversation today on why the tech industry specifically should really be looking at hiring a more neurodiverse workforce. And in order to really help us kind of round out this conversation, we have our very special guest, Megan Timko, who is also one of my ride or die girls. Um, she's coming straight out of the ATL. So she's repping Atlanta. And Megan is the the founder and CEO of Parallel International Consulting. Um, And Megan, we do this thing here where we like, we're not going to read off all your accolades and trust me, there's a lot, but can you just kind of give uh, the listeners an understanding of kind of like, how did you get involved with people with autism and really what galvanized you to start Parallel International Consulting? So my journey starts when I was 12 years old and I was a peer mentor for a boy named Nick. And he was autistic or is autistic. And um, 
it was one of the most, you know, I went in there not wanting to do it. I was sort of forced into this situation, but we ended up being friends. And I found myself always asking, well, what's going to happen to Nick? You know, I went on, I went to high school, I went to university and I always thought about, well, where, where is Nick now? And um, I continued to sort of take that thought and pursue a career where I could find an answer. I ended up working in early intervention. Um, I was very fortunate that I went to a university at the time that focused on behavior analysis. Um, and I had the opportunity to study under somebody that really inspired me to choose this as a career versus some other things. Um, and so I worked for a long time, 18 years in early intervention. And I kept asking myself though, where is everyone going after we're done with this? And there weren't any answers out there, to be quite honest. I mean, there were some some little answers here and there, slivers. Um, and I, I was, I was, I don't know, it kind of made me feel a little bit like I shouldn't be doing this. I should be finding out what's next. And I had an opportunity um, to work at a university here in Atlanta for a few years on solving that problem. Mm -hmm. And when COVID came along, the program was shut down because it was unfortunately the newest program. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I sat down for a second and I said, well, what do I do now? I spent my whole life doing this thing, COVID's here. And the answer was, I keep doing it. I keep finding the answer. And so I, went home after that walk and started Paralyzed. went online. I registered myself a little company and I took everything that I had done for the last three years and I just put it into action. And I had made a lot of really great friends um, all over, really all, all over the world that helped me kind of get to where I am today. But I studied what, what is the problem? Why aren't we getting people from A to B? And there were two answers to that. One of them is we're not preparing people for it. But the other end of that is we're not preparing the world for that. And so even if we do one, the other suffers. So we have to be doing both of these at the same time. And that's what I do at Parallel is I work on one side with families preparing everybody for making that transition. And then I work on the other side with corporations and communities on preparing sustainable spaces for people on the autism spectrum. Yeah, and I really am super interested in in talking more about the work that you do on the corp side mm -hmm. because I it is so needed. And again, that article from Forbes, I mean, and this is – and I don't know if you found this statistic, Sean, when you read this, like, staggering. I'm like, oh, gosh, I, you know, worked with so many, you know, families with children with autism. Autism currently, a, a, you know, impacts one in 54 individuals in the United States of America. So if you kind of look at the broader figures, you know, there are literally, you know – hundreds of thousands, millions of people that may, you know, experience autism in, in, in some way that live, that live here. And yet this autism at work program, which is working with like the creme de la creme of like U S corporations, like SAP, Microsoft, Salesforce only was able to employ 800 people in, in 2020. Um, and even looking at other, you know, adding in those other numbers and with other kind of initiatives, it's, it's 1500, which again is that's better than zero. So I don't want to minimize, you know, th that impact. Um, but really this is just scratching the surface in terms of the potential pool of people that could be employed. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, Megan and I have talked about so much is that tech is an, an industry that has been, you know, kind of the best position to hire a more neurodiverse, you know, uh, workforce. Um, and I wanted to kind of flesh out today, like the top five reasons that tech companies should really put resources towards hiring a more neurodiverse, um, group of individuals. And, and I want to start with this statistic and then we can kind of go from there. And so this is a source from the Harvard Business Review, which is also, uh, attack. We, I put this in our show notes. So you guys can check out this article as well. So the Harvard Business Review wrote that the case for neurodiverse hiring is especially compelling given the skills shortage shortages that increasingly afflict tech and other industries. So, for example, the European Union faces a, a shortage of 800,000 IT workers by 2020, uh, and the biggest deficits are expected to be in strategically important and rapidly expanding areas such as data analytics and IT services implementation, whose tasks are a good match with the abilities of some neurodiverse people. And so, Megan, can you just kind of like, like suss this out for us a little bit? So we have like this talent 
you know, kind of shortage. I mean, even like Sean, I don't, you know, like you've been involved in understanding even some of the challenges that we've had at, at Noe hiring people within the data analytics space. There's just, there's so many new tech companies coming out. There is this kind of like war for talent. Um, well, there's a severe need for talent. And then, I mean, the, the humanist side of it is that we have all these people, you know, based on that statistic that you mentioned, Sarah, that aren't given the opportunity to live up to their full potential. And that's mm -hmm. honestly tragic. Yeah. And it's like, I also like, I don't, I don't accept this. Right. And I think for so many of the families that I've worked with, and even like my friends that have adult children now with autism, you know, they're like, okay, so my kid gets to have like these great services or supports in schools or, you know, outside of schools. And what we refer to in our industry is like this like cliff because there is federal law IDEA um, that mandates that school districts, you know, provide specific types of services for, for persons that qualify up to age 22. And then after age 22, they're like, deuces, we're out. And so then depending on the state that you reside in, um, that is going to be a huge determinant in terms of whether or not you may be able to have, you know, meaningful work, you know, a, a place to live uh, on your own or with some type of, of support. Um, but this is, you know, for so many families, they're just like, what? I have this kid who's awesome and has so many different skills and who is going potentially to be a really great employee. And Megan's going to talk about why you know, the case for, you know, employing people in the, the neurodiverse um, community. And, you know, I, I think more, you see a lot of what's happening right now is there's a lot of micro enterprise that's happening in, in autism and with adults where parents are just like, hey, if there's not a path for my kid, like we're going to help create one because my kid has skills and talents and deserves to have a high quality of life. Um, yeah. So I feel like this is not just like, it's not a tech problem. It's also a human problem. But Megan, can you talk to us why there actually is a really, you know, compelling reasons why tech companies should look at this and not as necessarily a feel good initiative. And it can be, but actually because this is a, a profitable move. It's a very profitable move. And I think there's a few other things that sort of teed this up. Right. And so you think about a company like SAP who's incredibly progressive um, in terms of culture and so thankful that they decided to go out and do this. They were really the people that sort of uh, set the trend and sort of peer pressured a lot of their other uh, corporate peers into creating these hiring programs. And um, the value here is you're right. A lot of people do it because it, it feels good. Um, but the value really comes in the employee. You get a, co a lot of people in the SAP sort of like autism at work world hire in a cohort method. And so they bring in a few people at a time. They train those people to have a position. And it's great and it works great. But what we started to see with the limited outcome data is that the uh, neurodivergent cohorts are outperforming their neurotypical peers, uh, both, in, both in efficiency and in lots of other unmeasurable ways. Um, and we don't have, unfortunately, a lot of data around it right now, but what we do have is low absenteeism, extremely low turnover, um, high efficiency, especially if you look at some other industries that you can kind of measure more task data, the efficiency rate is double what a neurotypical individual is. And so I'm going, oh my gosh, we have a bunch of people who want to work, who want to work at your company that are not going to quit that don't want to leave and they're going to outperform most of the people working for you right now, what's the disconnect here? Why aren't we doing more of this? And so I think that's a big question. We can answer it a lot of different ways. But um, one of the biggest reasons I think we have that disconnect is that employers don't understand that ROI. And we have to start talking more about that piece of it than sort of evangelizing that just do it because it's a great press release. Um, and, and that got the door open and that's great. Um, but I think what we need to be evangelizing right now is, do you want employees who are going to rarely make a mistake, always going to show up, and they're not going to quit because the next company came along and offered them a little bit more money? Um, a lot of the um, behavioral characteristics of individuals on the autism spectrum are they want to do the same thing over and over. And so if we can create environments that are conducive to that sort of work, you've got an employee for life. Mm -hmm. um, and in an industry dying for employees for life. <laughs> Here we go. Like, let's solve each other's problems here. That's incredible. It sounds like there's a, a, a serious business advantage to hiring. Oh, God, I sound like a sound clip, but it sounds like there's a serious <laughs> business advantage to hiring a neurodiverse workforce um, beyond, I mean, even what I expected or what I read from reading that article. Yes, there is. And you think about what this does. 
this helps individuals, this helps, you know, whatever the company is that ends up creating these hiring initiatives. And on top of that, this is corporate capability at its finest. There are many um, corporations in the technology world that have the ability to do this because in the beginning we were looking at, wow, who's big enough to absorb the cost of success and the risk of failure. And that's why we started with big companies because if you're a small company, you're going, oh my gosh, how am I going to absorb the cost of success and the risk of failure? A lot of people didn't wanna do it, but now we have positive exemplars all over the world that this works. And we know that we can do this on a big scale and on a small scale. And I'll stress a small scale now that we know the numbers that are out there. They're only hiring people in small cohorts, right? So four, six, 12 people at a time so that it's done correctly, done the right way. And so when you think about um, a small company that's considering a hiring program, the fear is, well, of course, SAP can do that. They're huge. But when you find out it's only a few people at a time, it eases the fear of, I can't get my arms around this. And it shows people, oh, okay, yeah, I can do this. And to boot, the average accommodation is no more than any other employee that accesses ADA accommodations. It's like 400 bucks, if that. And we do have data around that. And one thing, part of Parallel International Consulting is part of uh, the newer diversity hub. And mm -hmm. that's also a, a resource that I've linked in the show notes because it's, I really love this because it gives, you know, really concrete supports for potential employers that are looking to hire a newer diverse workforce. And I want to talk about a couple of things that, you know, that people might perceive as barriers um, to hiring a newer diverse works, workforce and, and I want to just kind of like break some of those barriers down um, because again, like Megan, you and I, I mean, we've spent, you know, most of our adult lives, you know, living in, you know, community and working with individuals with autism. So we're like, oh, cool. We got this. We feel really comfortable. I feel totally equipped and, you know, fine uh, to have someone that's newer, diverse uh, work with me. But this may be something that for some people that might not have those experiences, they're like, oh my gosh, but I don't, what do, what do I do? Um, and, you know, disclaimer just because you met one person with autism, you've you've met one person with autism, and there, and, and so in no way, shape, or form are we suggesting that all people that are you know have uh, experienced autism are in you know totally the same. But I think there are some kind of like general rules um, that can be you know really helpful. But I would those would never replace you know being more individualized with with some of the the supports that you offer. But if you go on the neurodiversity resources page, they have a whole PDF that is free and downloadable. It's 22 pages and it's tips for um, uh, exhibitors at a, a employer expos in terms of how to make a space more inclusive for neurodiverse students and things that they can do um, to really attract neurodiverse students. So one of the things they could do, you know, is reduce sensory stimulation, ask about a student's interests don't worry about the eye contact, mm -hmm. um, speak clearly and concisely, be patient, listen, you know, um, be open. Uh, and then they have, you know, if you go down the neurodiversity hub resource page, they have, you know, uh, information and flyers like autism for employers. Like how might we talk about this to employers? How do we, you know, understand autism? Um, talking about feminine, feminine versus masculine strengths, talking about strengths based job matching, Megan, in your experience, what do you think have been like the biggest barriers um, for employers in terms of, of hiring a new newer diverse workforce? It comes down to one thing, fear. Fear that it's not going to be done right. Fear that they don't know what they're doing. Fear that someone's going to come in and, and do something that they don't understand how to address. Um, you know, you can kind of fill in the blank after fear, but really it's just fear of blank. And mm -hmm. When you familiarize somebody with sort of the um, nuances of individuals with autism or the general nuances, as you said, um, people kind of ease back a little bit, but people will hold on to that fear like you wouldn't believe. Um, you know, I've had a couple people that I've approached because I see that they have a workspace that this would be conducive with. Mm -hmm. And I try to kind of lay it out and they're like, oh, no, no, no. And let me tell you why. And they will architect a web of fear that I can pull apart pretty easily and kind of help them with either resources or pointing them to the neurodiversity hub information. Um, but once you clear that out, then you can kind of have the real conversation. But if that's one of the big barriers, and it almost always is, um, you have to address that. And sometimes if it's a company where you can't get everybody in the room, 
you have to address it multiple times. Mm -hmm. So if there's like 100 or 150 employees, which, you know, I've gone into a company about that size and you get the C-suite on board, great. But then maybe another department is like, no, we're not going to do it over here. And so you have to do it again. And then then you have another department that's like, yeah, we're going to do it. It's great. You've got to get everyone on the same page. And so that would be the secondary barrier is after you clear conflicts on on that first one, kind of getting everybody else on board and familiarized with that this is going to happen um, and that it can work, but it takes everybody collaborating. And that fierce collaboration piece is something that is very important. And it's why if it fails, that's why it fails sometimes. And I was also going to add another, I'm like scrolling the neurodiversity hub, like while we're talking to like, cause they really do, they have great resources. Mm-hmm. And so one of, again, and these are all free and publicly available. Uh, so one of the resources they have is how to successfully onboard a new autistic employee in the first thing that th- this article talks about, um, and, and I can't underscore this enough, is ask the autistic person yeah. about what they need. I, I think sometimes there is this thinking of like, like to your point, Megan, like, oh, we're scared. We don't know what to do. So we're going to kind of like stay in our own heads or like talk about it as like a management group or, you know, whomever is working collaboratively with this individual. And it's like, if you're interested in getting to know this individual better and what they need, why didn't you ask that person. Yes. <laughs> uh, just ask them. That um, is, people cannot, <laughs> you know, I have a lot of funny stories about that, but mostly I think about if you're ever, have you ever been somewhere where you've been put in a room and there's a bunch of other people somewhere else and you know, they're talking about what's going to happen next, but you're not part of that conversation. And so they, the employers, meaning the corporate side, there's some times where I have to bring this on lightly because once you say it like that, like you just said it, you're going, oh, of course, I should just ask them. Um, but it's not how people lead. People go, we're going to have a meeting about this and talk about it and then come up with a solution. And the solution is there, right there with the person. Um, but they'll have another meeting about that. Well, how are we going to talk to this person about what he needs or talk to him about this? And this is, you know, there's no communication barrier most of the time. So you can just go, hi, what desk would you like? Instead of having an HR summit over what desk will we purchase for this person? Right. And so that is really a good point. And part of the problem, I think, in that gap where we have prepared individuals and companies that want to do this, but no bridge between them, is we have not allowed for individuals with autism to have a lot of equity in the conversation. And we have to be better about that. Um, you know, across all DNI issues, that's a really big problem, but it's a problem here as well, and probably a bigger problem. Um, and I think of people who have never been in the world of autism assume that um, there's they have to be careful or they can't talk to them about their disability or their differently abled, um, you know, how they'll get to work. And we have to have that conversation better. We have to say, come in the room or let's all have this meeting together and let's solution it together because um, the outcomes are just so much better when that happens. How, with Parallel, where are you finding that you are mostly getting referrals from families that then might have connections to businesses that they connect you to and you kind of work as that bridge between, you know, the individual, you know, with autism and the employer, or are you getting more interest from employers and then you can kind of work that back to families or how are you kind of managing or navigating the the relationship with the, you know, as you address kind of like the two, the two primary issues that you talked about earlier, like we have to help, you know, create the, this education and support for the, the individual and understanding and skills. Then we have to prepare the world. And by preparing the world, that means we have to prepare employers to be able to make sure that they are, you know, ready to, you know, welcome a newer diverse workforce and support them appropriately. Yeah. You know, ask me tomorrow, I'll have a different answer. But today, <laughs> you know, today, I just how it is today, I kind of get an equal amount of both, but there are waves of both of them. And so it kind of depends on actually, I'll be really honest, if there's been a big press release about something, mm-hmm. um, I'll get a bunch of calls from the corporate side, or if there's been another press release about a family, you know, like a 60 minutes article or a new show or something like that, um, I'll get a deluge of emails related to that. Um, Because there's not a lot of people doing what I'm doing. And sidebar, I would encourage anybody who wants to do this to go do it because 
everyone who's in this space is overwhelmed. Um, but, you know, I think when I started out, I assumed that I would just be working on one side. But as it became evident that domestically and abroad, this problem exists across that whole, you know, like A to B bridge, mm -hmm. um, we're left with no choice but to work on both sides at the same time. We have mm -hmm. to. Um, because otherwise we end up with a, like just a cattywampus situation. Can I use that word? I'm from the South, like a, a cattywampus situation. I don't even know what that means, but I'm loving it. Like Sean, I don't know how you feel, but like, I love all the, like the Southernism. <laughs> like I was like, this is not, you know, my language, but like, I'll pick it up and I'll use it. Like, just like y'all, yeah. I have realized that y'all is the most inclusive term in the English language. I use it all the time. Yes. Yes. And gender neutral. And right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Gender neutral, total inclusive, y'all, or to next level it up, all y'all, which is now becoming part of my, you know, standard vernacular. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you a shirt. The Atlanta United team has, uh, at the end of the field, they have this like group of people who are just like crazy fans and they make these big flags. And one of them is, uh, this is huge, it's like 50 feet long. It says all y'all. And they just wave at the whole game at the other team. Mm -hmm. So I'll get you one of those shirts. Yeah. So, yeah. So we end up, if we don't do all y'all at one time, it gets cattywampus. And so <laughs> <it's kind> of, <laughs> I put it all together. So we have to be helping everyone, you know, how I've, how I've ended up doing that is just as much as I can on both fronts. Mm -hmm. When we think about the solution to this, it requires a collaborative community approach. And I'm going to use that word and it sounds small, but it's really big because it takes three sides of this, right? It takes the community at large, it takes the education piece, and it takes the corporate community to all come together and agree on how this is gonna work. Um, we haven't done it yet. We still got three silos, but they're walking towards each other a little bit more every day. And I consider this whole thing to be, um, you know, I guess a workforce development issue where historically we've allowed it to become very siloed for lots of different reasons that, you know, I could talk forever on, but we've got to take those barriers out and walk towards each other because we aren't going to make a whole solution without wholly talking about, you know, talk about let's all get in the room together. This is that situation. We need to all be in the room together to say, how will we get A to B and make sustainable employment instead of, oh, hey, there's this job and, you're this person, so let's put you together, which has been how we've done it so far, and instead educate individuals to walk towards something they want to do um, and then find a job that they can do really well at and then create a sustainable solution so that we don't have um, you know, just another gig economy of neurodiverse people floating around without benefits. We want sustainable employment. Um, and I think that's what the tech industry could really glean from this is, you could have a sustainable employee and a really great one if you did a few small fixes here and there with your hiring process and mm -hmm. then solve your problem of i don't have enough people to work here um pretty quickly in my opinion yeah so my you know then kind of like summary question for you would be if someone's listening to this podcast and they are, you know, in a position within a, you know, a tech company to either they hire people directly or can influence the hiring, where might these people go to, to start this process? Like, Hey, gosh, we've identified like, okay, we see this value proposition, you know, that you are, are giving in terms of neurodiversity as it relates to tech. Um, we think that that could be really interesting. So how do we do it? So it's interesting. A lot of people assume this is going to start in HR, but <laughs> that is um, somebody actually involved with the neurodiversity hub. When I first got involved with them, he said to me, Megan, <laughs> HR is where dreams go to die. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that um, checks out. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so tech people, don't start it there. Um, you need to find sort of somebody in a senior role, um, preferably somebody in the C-suite that really adopts this as a baby and says, I am going to make sure this happens so that when it finally gets to HR and they tell me the 500 reasons we can't do it, um, somebody that's in control of the situation can kind of clear all of that out. 
And so, uh, okay. So yeah. it has to get like more of a top down approach as this yeah. is a value and strategic initiative. So if you're going to potentially, if the HR department is for lack of a better term, like cock blocking, I will help like remove those barriers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so go ahead. I'm sorry, Sean. No, no. I'm, I was actually, this is a bit of a segue, but I was going to ask you uh, how the company's. I'm getting like a slight echo, sorry. Um, how the company's approach towards neurodiversity in general or mental health um, plays into this. Because a lot of companies have a very rigid structure to begin with about what they mm -hmm. expect out of employees. They're not very accommodating for you know people with anxiety disorders or depression or things like that. And uh, one of the quotes from the article that uh, Sarah mentioned earlier uh, is that they said, you know, we're learning the importance of addressing comorbidities that have neurological ties to autism. Perhaps most importantly, going forward, we need to confront the powerful mental health comorbidities that undermine employment. Uh, such comorbidities uh, as obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder have neurological ties to autism. And uh, they bring impediments to job success that are far more serious than failure to make eye contact or understand social cues. And so, you know, it seems like we we have a lot of companies that are still kind of old fashioned about understanding that humans are humans and yeah. we have all challenges and, and, you know, little things that make us difficult. And then um, bringing in a neurodiverse workforce or, or autistic people into that equation can be difficult if they don't already have that bridge of, you know, some understanding. Yeah. And that's a great point. You know, these are another, that's another situation where these programs have failed before. If your company is not a great place for a neurotypical person to work, it is going to be horrible for a neurodivergent person to work at. Um, and so this isn't, this should not be the method to like clean up your culture. You got a culture check before you decide to start one of these programs because it is, uh, and I'm not talking just maybe any DNI program. If you're going to start one, that can be a canary in the coal mine. And if you have people working 18 hour days and the boss is a micromanager and people aren't allowed to move their chairs around, you know, any number of things that can kind of make a really aggressive and toxic workplace, it, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be something to really consider on the front end. And sometimes I have companies that call and I will say no, mm -hmm. because if their processes aren't in check if they don't have a collaborative work environment, if it's aggressive on the management level, it's just, it's not worth the effort when there are other companies who have a really ripe place to do one of these things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, even just imagine like if you're an autistic person and you're coming into the situation where you've had trouble maintaining employment or getting through interviews and you know, it's, it'd be very easy to have some depression or especially anxiety to go with that. And then being put into this position where this is your one shot special program where people are giving you a chance, you know, the, the anxiety already has to be at like level nine mm -hmm. uh, just because of the situation. And so yeah. the more understanding and accommodating and, and supportive work environment that can exist across the board, not just for autism, but, you know, for humans in general, it seems like that that would be a really important factor in success. Yeah. And I yeah. think like what's in, you know, what I hope is an output of COVID. And it's like, we started this whole podcast today talking about like, Hey, we're like, kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're all vaccinated. Megan's going to Iceland. Like people are kind of starting to resume some semblance of, of normalcy. But I think what's been very clear with everyone and we see all of the articles published, whether it's, you know, in TechCrunch or the New York times, or, you know, on your Facebook feed is people's mental health has been like, deteriorating throughout the last year and almost i feel like right now it's like in this like steady state of just like general anxiety because it's like yeah where there's things that are opening up but it's still kind of like not the end and no one like really knows when there's going to be the end and like it's just like this like constant state of stress and so i'm hoping that employers and I, I see some are doing this, are recognizing that like, gosh, this is affecting everyone in our organization. Um, people's mental health matters. If you want people to do well at work, people that do well at work are people that are feeling good in their bodies. And that might mean that we might need to approach this a little differently. And by doing that better, how does that actually open us up to be a workplace that is more um, conducive and open to hiring actually all kinds of different people with great talent that might have been crowded out of a previous environment because we weren't acknowledging those things. And, you know, and, and so I, 
I think that's really helpful, Megan. And would you say, Megan, like if someone had a question, like I'm thinking about this, I don't know. Are, are you comfortable? Like I linked your website to, to the show notes here. Like I want to also point to a specific resource. And this is also why I very specifically asked you to come on today is like, I want a single point of contact that someone can like, Hey, I have questions or I want to potentially explore this. You're that person. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, call, let's chat. Let's chat about it. You know, email me yeah. and let me know that this is something you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to consider when going out and deciding that you're going to start a whole program. But I also want to say that if you're a small tech company and you have one opening and you find a neurodiverse individual that can work in that position, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to launch a ticker tape parade and have the New York Times cover what you're doing. You can just do it. Yeah. Um, and you can bring one person into your organization and kind of learn together. And I have seen that happen multiple times and it's very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to agree that you're going to kind of figure it out as you go along and that like any employee you hire, things can go wrong. Um, but also like any employee you hire, things could also go really, really right. Um, and it could be a great fit. And so you don't have to have a program um, to hire somebody with autism. You just have to have a job that they could do. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, that's perfect. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a program. It doesn't have to be this whole thing. It has to be like, Hey, we have a need. And we think this like person, you know, that has autism could, you know, fill it. And so like, let's make it happen um, and support people to be really successful in this again, like intensely competitive environment where there's, you know, a war for talent. Um, and also I think from, you know, my viewpoint, the more that we can do this with all different types of people, the, you know, larger, all of our worlds become, you know, the more that we can connect with each other and a, you know, the more, um, that we can really kind of remove, I think those barriers, especially I think for people that experience disability, whether it's visible or invisible, uh, I think so many people just feel like, gosh, we're like the last frontier on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and especially because autism is, is not, you know, um, not necessarily a visible disability, and, but yet like the employment numbers are so low. The suicide rate for adults with autism is 11 X what it is for neurotypical people. Um, and again, like that's, I don't accept that. And so, you know, you can just start with, with the one job um, and then that makes it two. And then your, you know, colleague hears about it in, within your network. And then that's five. And like, that's, it's the small wins um, that make the big change. And so let's get more of the small wins. Yeah. That's how it's going to happen. Like a million small wins is still a million jobs. A million jobs. Yeah. yeah. A million jobs. Cool. Yeah. Megan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, I, I love the work you're doing. And I just want to say that I learned a lot on this call. I know you're both uh, already very aware of, you know, the autism world and, and uh, the employment challenges there. But uh, this was very educational for me and hopefully for our audience as well. Thanks. I'm, I'm really glad to have come on. And this was really awesome. And I'm glad you learned so much. I know. Thanks, Megan. Cool. We out. <laughs> Yeah, I'll send you guys pictures from my phone. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Data Dump by Noe. We hope that you've learned something by listening to this podcast today, or minimally, we've entertained you and made your lunch hour move a little faster. You can follow us on all of the podcast platforms, Google Play, Spotify, Apple. And if you're interested in knowing more about who we are, feel free to check us out, www.noe, that's K-N-O-W-I.com. And if you want to reach out to us and if you have questions you want to ask us, you can do that too. But we don't really know you, so I don't know if we're going to give you our email address. So why don't you just go on our website instead? Okay, cool. <laughs>